Welcome to Transformation with Martinet. Martinet Emmons is a transformational life coach who broke free from childhood abuse, sexual trauma, and overcame cancer to become a powerful force of healing and hope for others. Martinet describes traumatic events as fierce emotional tsunamis. They can leave impending doom and destructive tidal waves of emotions that hit you when you least expect it. Martinet helps her clients dive into the depths of their trauma and pain as she stands fiercely advocating for them to shine a light on those experiences and find the lesson in the pain. She serves as a beacon of hope that guides you to see the strength, lessons, and purpose that can be born from the pain. You can feel alive with purpose again when you awaken your dormant strength. Step into your power with a sense of peace and discover a new wave of hope with the right tools and support. Martinet and her guests are here shining their lights today through empowering stories of hardship and transformation to inspire you to find hope and to see that there is a beautiful blue ocean of serenity, happiness, and fulfillment in your future. Transformation with Martinet starts now. just talked about getting emotional and here I am um (laughs) things just start coming up when that music plays for me um so everybody welcome this is transformation with Martinet that's me where we overcome everything and compromise nothing for those of you that are new my show is about hope and the guests that I invite on my show all have what is wrong with me again um all have a story (laughs) of of overcoming I believe all of us as well as they do that we as humans can get over anything. We really can, and we can thrive in our lives. My show is every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, and my guest today, I'm excited. And part of this is because it has been, God, my life journey since I was 11 years old is Mm -hmm. um, eating disorder. And I still, to be truthful with all of you, still battle it. Um, I have a coach that I work extensively with it on it because the thing about me, I've just not found a place yet where I am completely safe in my body. I know that's very vulnerable, but it's my truth. So I wanna to welcome today my, my friend, Dr. Laura, Des- huh. Dr. Laura Zabaris, who is an expert on diet culture. Please introduce yourself, my friend. Ha. Thank you so much, Martine. First of all, can I say I am so honored to be a guest on your show today. I love what you stand for and the whole transformation thing I think is incredible. So my name is Lara Zabaris. I am a psychologist and a food freedom coach. My background is in psychology and it's really only in the last few years that I've got into the food freedom arena. So I'm all about helping women create a healthy and happy relationship with food without guilt or emotional eating. That's so good. It's so good. And it's so necessary. It's like, it doesn't matter what age you are. For me, it started very young, but sometimes circumstances in our life, it could come a lot later. Cause I Mm -hmm. I know that I talked to so many women and one of the reasons I, well, I knew I had a problem long before this, but one of the reasons that really stood out as my mind is because I was drawn to people like you. Mm. I, I read everything. Everybody who teaches like you or everybody that has certain um, issues are the same. I'm, I'm just glam onto it. You know, I was trying to find something there. So well, how did your journey start? And then where are you at now? Mm. You know, in regards to bulimia, orthorexia, which honestly, I don't even know what that one is, which is odd. So, yeah. So my story really starts when I was 16. I started dieting then and I started for a combination of reasons. I think partly I was getting negative comments about my body, but also partly because I saw a lot of the people around me dieting. So I just thought that that was the normal and natural thing to do. So 16 years old, decided to jump on all the fatty diets that were around at the time. I tried the Atkins diet. I followed diets I saw in magazines that were all about 
I guess, low cal- calorie and restriction. I did the fat free diet. And that period of time led to very disordered eating and eventually to an eating disorder in the form of bulimia. And I think for me, what I was experiencing is I was either restricting, extreme restricting in, in while I was trying to follow that diet, but then I was finding that I wasn't able to stick to the diet and that led to binging and then purging. And it was only a little bit later that I realized that it was an actual eating disorder. So it took me quite a while to realize that what I was doing was not a normal thing to be doing. So it was in my early 20s that I went to go and seek eating disorder counseling, Mm -hmm. went to see uh, a qualified psychologist here in in the UK, and also a nutrition counselor, because I felt like I'd forgotten how to eat. I didn't really know what was normal because I was so used to either extreme restricting or eating so much that I felt sick and then obviously was throwing up. And, And then those people that I spoke to really helped me overcome my fear foods, help me get back to quote unquote normal eating. And then I had a a few years of relative food freedom uh, in my sort of mid to late twenties into my early thirties. And then I had children and this just brought back the the whole pregnancy thing just brought back, um, I guess, body image issues. And it wasn't so much whilst I was pregnant, it was post pregnancy where I was feeling that real, um, I don't know, that kind of from diet culture telling me that I should get my body back, that I should get back to my pre-pregnancy weight, that whole message that you hear about nine months out, nine, my, nine months up, nine months down, the whole bounce back culture. So I thought, well, I want to get my body back, but I don't want to go back to dieting because I knew that I, you know, I had that eating disorder, I'd overcome it. So I knew I didn't want to go back to diet. And that's when I really got sucked into wellness culture. (laughs) And I think now looking back on it, it was diet culture in disguise for me, because what I ended up doing was cutting out a whole load of foods for my quote unquote health and started the whole, again, quote unquote, clean eating regime. I followed, followed a whole load of wellness influence who were telling me to cut out gluten or cut out Um, dairy no sugar and that kind of thing so I went through this process for maybe a couple of years and I didn't realize again at the time but how disordered it was and I had this very these very restrictive rigid rules and actually I think now in hindsight that was a period of orthorexia and orthorexia is that uh, over obsession on eating in a healthy way and it gets to a stage where it becomes unhealthy because you're focused too much on trying to be healthy. And so I was restricting so much food. I had these very rigid um, rules around food, very restrictive. And then I started to see even more disordered eating. So I was finding that I was overeating or binging really on food that was quote unquote healthy. So if I would bake something like sweet potato brownies, I was seeing myself wanting to eat like literally the whole tray because it was quote unquote um, healthy. And then I was finding myself having these huge sugar cravings, even though I had ostensibly quit sugar. And then the other thing, I think this was the real kicker for me is that I was starting to, it was starting to impact my mental health and also my ability to enjoy enjoy things I, I I couldn't really go to restaurants anymore because it would be very stressful experience I find that I didn't really have anything that I could eat there were a lot of oops um fear foods for me um I was worried about going out with friends because I didn't want to be in a in a situation where I had to eat basically and thankfully for me because of my previous experience with eating disorder, when I started to see these disordered eating habits, or I, it started mm-hmm. to be so obvious to me, that's when I thought, oh my goodness, this is starting to become a problem. And it was also because my, my, my little girl, I think she was seeing some of the things that I was doing. And that really hit me actually very much. I started to see her starting to obsess over things like sugar. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, this is not good. What am I? She's yeah. obviously role modeling me and seeing something in me that she's now copying. Um, and I did a complete 180 turn. I just thought I can't be doing this. So I had been introduced to concepts like intuitive eating and the health at every size movement. And it was just I, I basically read everything I could on on these concepts and I made a complete 180 turn. I had also trained to be a health coach at roughly the same time when I was sort of in my orthorexia and I made a massive 180 turn in what I was doing. So I kind of re re um, coached. I, I learned about intuitive eating. I relearned that concept or I learned that concept mm-hmm. and I re relaunched my coaching as as food freedom so did a massive 180 turn so yeah so that's my journey through two different eating disorders and where I am now so fully recovered and you know total food freedom now yeah and and the thing like you've reached a point where you're not afraid to eat you're not afraid you're gonna yeah blow up you know that um I don't worry about that anymore, but I still, I still have to write everything down. I eat, I don't write the calories anymore, but I get it out of my head because I used to be where I would just like be doing whatever it was and just like, what did I eat today? And it was just like a a total freak out kind of mode. Mm. And boy, I I know that I want to say for me, it was right around. So I started about 11 and then about 23 years old, something like that. I realized, you know, if I keep purging I'm mean, not mm. only like have some kind of cancer here I'm probably never going to get pregnant I'm and that was the one I wanted most of anything was would have children yeah so it kind of tapered off I wouldn't do as as much of that and um but I was still like a dieting kind of person mm. and um it's only actually very recently because like what you mentioned about your daughter I know I put this on them I have three mm. kids a son and two girls and all of them have mentioned things like that, you know, like, um, my son will always defend me. He'll be like, the girls will say something. Well, you know, mom would have all these snacks like apples and peanut butter or something. And, and he's like, well, that's healthy. And they're like, yeah, but she would restrict the other stuff. I mean, they knew it. They knew what I was doing. And I often would say things like, well, um, you know, we don't want to get overweight I don't I don't mm-hmm. want you to be made fun of or anything and I'm like gosh I think back at that now it's like oh, oh no mm. but I had so much fear on me that I didn't want them to be made fun of or whatever it was and um I, I just like gosh I if I go back in time that was definitely something that I would like one thing for me but don't put it on my kids yeah you know yeah so we're going to take a break in two minutes um but what what can you explain um just like what does diet culture mean per se so basically diet culture is this sort of set of beliefs or set of ideas that values thinness or your Mm -hmm. shape your aesthetic above everything else including your mental health so what it does is then shapes our perceptions of weight, health, and appearance. So what it means to be healthy. Mm -hmm. We think it has a certain size or a certain look. Right, for sure, for sure. Because we we should, um, we have to eat. (laughs) So we shouldn't be afraid. We should just be able to listen, right? Because our bodies are so wise. And I think some of us don't get that until later in life, which I didn't. I didn't, I just thought my body was just like, well, was my vessel it takes me around wherever I'm going but I didn't Mm -hmm. think that much about it you know but she is so wise if we just listen she tells us what to do yeah right she does okay so um do you do you I I I've seen both but like do you believe this it, it affects men as much as women are close I wouldn't say as much, but I think it's definitely starting to. Um, I think there are a lot of men coming out now saying that, that or admitting to the fact that they've had disordered eating or eating disorders. I think it's less common in men, but it's definitely it's definitely there, 100%. Right. Okay, yeah. well, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get back. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we'll be back with Dr. Laura Zabaris, and we're going to talk more about diet culture and ways to 
if this is a struggle for you, ways to um, move on from it and start to trust yourself and your body. All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Transformation with Martine. This is where we overcome everything and compromise nothing. Today, my guest is Dr. Laura Zabaris, and we are talking about diet culture. She is a psychologist that focuses on food freedom. And, you know, some people, and this just popped in my head, some people think that food freedom is counting calories, counting macros. Um, as long as I'm in this range, I'm okay, but that's not true freedom, is it? No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think food freedom is the opposite, actually. I think if we go back to what we were saying about diet culture, a lot of what we learn mm -hmm. um, tells us that we need to rely on external cues to know what's healthy. So that's why we count calories or we count macros or we follow certain eating plans. But in actual fact, I think that that approach can create very disordered eating. So if you're always focusing on, on that external, just like you said before the break, you're ignoring your own internal signals and you're forgetting what your body wants and needs. You're just relying on that external cue. Yeah. So you think about any diet that's out there or you might call it a healthy eating plan, but there's the low calorie ones that restrict mm -hmm. how much you eat. There's others that will say all foods are OK, but we're going to we're going to grade them red, amber and green. So, you know, mm. that you can eat more of the green and less of the red. But what you're doing is you're again, that's disordered because you're telling the person that, that some foods are much better than mm. others. There's other approaches that cut whole food groups. Think about intermittent fasting. You're limiting the period of time that you can actually eat. And so there's all these rigid rules and that's very diet culture focused. Food freedom is the complete opposite. So we're letting go of the restriction and we're also letting go of labeling food. So we're taking away the moral judgment from food. And I do agree because sometimes people say to me, yeah, but, you know, spinach is better than chocolate or you know, packet of sweets. And I'll say, yes, spinach has more nutrients in it than a sweet I totally agree with that but we don't need to lay moral judgment on whether one is good or bad because some point some points in your day spinach is exactly what you need but in another point of day maybe you do need want desire appreciate a sweet and that's what food freedom is it's about listening to your body's internal cues and, and going with that. So it's tuning into what your body wants and needs. So when you say that tuning in, because I know I've, I've learned so much um, in the recent past where I've really decided I've got to tackle this because it's still, mm. it may not be like it was in my twenties or earlier than that, but it still crops up, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do you know, like the difference between a craving um, like say, well, yeah, okay, like a craving and and trying to maybe heal an emotional hurt. Yeah. yeah. Or what your body really wants. Yeah. So it's a really good question. And this is something that I work on extensively with my clients because often what people call cravings or what they see as emotional eating is actually just your body's reaction to the food restriction so when you go on a diet and any diet so this could be something that you're calling a healthy eating plan or it's not a diet it's a lifestyle but any kind of food restriction what your body wants to do is not starve so as soon as you restrict food, it thinks that there is a famine. And this obviously goes back to way back in cave person days when, you know, if there was a famine, that would be really bad for your body. So your body immediately, it kind of goes into lockdown and it starts noticing more food around. So if anyone's ever been on a diet and they know, you know, that moment when you're like, I just see food everywhere. Your, yeah. bo your body is programmed. Your brain is programmed to do that. Yeah. 
People also say that they feel more hungry and they feel like they need to eat more food. And that's, again, your body's way of um, getting you to eat more food. It produces more hunger hormones and it takes more food to actually make you feel full. So as soon as it feels that famine, which is a diet, basically, that's what it does. So your body's programmed to get you to eat more. And it also what it does is it slows down your metabolism. So you go on this diet and you're immediately biologically programmed to try and eat more food. So we're actually ignoring our internal cues by saying it's not hunger. I'm just going to drink something or I'm going to eat a rice cake or I'll just ignore it. I'll, I can't eat until 1 p.m. So what people often think is a craving or emotional eating is actually your body's response to that restriction so you've restricted so much and you feel hungry <laughs> so if you think about it, I remember this when all the diets that I did when I was a teenager and in my early 20s it would tell me that I could only eat at 1 p.m and you start feeling hungry at 12 and you do your best I used to think I was being amazing and all that willpower I have because I was ignoring my hunger cues and then eventually I would eat now that craving or is actually just hunger and then the other thing that a lot of people experience and this might really resonate with listeners is that you restrict for a period of time and it might be during the day or maybe over the course of a week and then suddenly you have this overwhelming urge to eat and so anyone who has binged or what you know however they might term it you know you feel like you've fallen off the wagon you eat a whole tub of ben and jerry's that mm -hmm. feels like emotional eating because you're like i couldn't control myself or i got sad and so i ate a whole tub of ice cream but it's what you're doing is it's a natural again cycle that your body goes through you're restricting and your body's trying to get you to eat so it turns into a binge so you it turns into this restrict and then binge, which is almost like a pendulum. So, you know, at one extreme is the restrict and then your body goes all the way back there to the binge to try and catch up on the calories that it's missed out on, basically. So again, that's something that a lot of people say, I'm an emotional eater because I can't stop myself. It feels overwhelming. It's so urgent that, you know, that, that feeling to just eat. And again, that's your body's response to restriction. But then you also mentioned about what about is an actual emotion, you know, emotional eating, so actual emotional eating. And that also does happen. So if you know that it's not because you've been restricting and you haven't dieted and you haven't been restricting, but you are someone who gets sad or bored or frustrated or angry and reaches for food, that is emotional eating. Now, I always say to my clients that if you do this from time to time, let's say you have a really stressful day at work and you come home and you end up um, coping with that emotion by eating food, it's fine. You know, food is an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. So if you do it from time to time, it's not a problem. But it could be a problem for you if you're doing it every day and it becomes a habit and you're you know, you always get, you're bored every day at work and you come home and you snack on some crisps or you don't have any other way to cope. So that's when I would say you really want to look at other ways to cope with life, you know, cope with your emotions. And it's different things for different people. It might be that you need to start sharing your feelings with friends. Maybe you do need to see a therapist about certain things and, or maybe it's as simple as having other needs met. So I say to some people, you know, journaling can help. Sometimes people find recording something on their phone can be really record their feelings. They don't want to necessarily tell someone, but they want to get their feelings out. Recording it on a phone can be a quite a cathartic way to just express those emotions. It might be that you need a bit more support around the house. You know, it's obviously different for different people. But to me, that indicates there is an emotional need that is being unmet. And what you want to do is find a way to meet that need. And for some people, it is just experiencing the, the emotion. Allow yourself to feel that anger, frustration, stress. I think we are in a, in a stage 
in the world where we don't want to experience those emotions, but actually sometimes we have to, you know, sometimes a good cry is all you need. Yes, yes. Because your body's trying to tell you something anyway. Yeah. So yeah. I know a lot of times I would do whatever it was to distract myself so I didn't have to mm-hmm. feel anything or True. find that ice cream, you know, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> and um, gosh, it, it, it's like the more you start trusting yourself and the more you start listening to yourself, yes. the more your body will share with you. I know I've made dramatic results myself and with my own clients by inviting them inviting myself to just sit with it yes it's uncomfortable yeah but it's just kind of flows through you if you just Mm. sit there and garner any wisdom that comes up because you get a lot and sometimes it takes your body maybe a little while to trust you again because you've been ignoring Mm -hmm. it for so long but when we do start to trust again it's 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 amazing yeah i and i agree with you so much i mean sometimes it is literally just just to sit and feel and experience because we are so used to numbing we try to say well I don't want to I don't want to deal with that now I don't want to experience that but actually you know for your long-term mental health that's sometimes the best thing to do is just to sit with that emotion and experience it oh yeah oh yeah yeah um so before we take a break again what would you say I guess is just a quick thing before we go um if someone feels like they can't trust themselves, even to go like shopping or having certain things in the, in the house, what would you say to that? Like, I, oh, I think two things I would say, let's let go of the restriction. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is to stop labeling food, remove all food labels. Mm-hmm. So food is neither good nor bad. It's just food. So it's an apple or a chocolate bar or yeah. lunch or dinner right so those are my two two tips because I know you've talked about that you can have anything in your house now it's okay yes yeah I can and it's so different because I used to keep everything out of my house I would not have crisps chocolate biscuits ice cream anything that I could binge on but now it's all there and once you take away it, when it stops being on a pedestal it becomes less yeah. desirable it's there and you don't fancy it so much yeah but it's just, a process yeah. to go through right because it's like well if you want it you can have it exactly. and it doesn't mean you know you want it again tomorrow so you don't have to worry about getting yeah. it all out now or eat it yeah. all now and then this yeah to tomorrow exactly. to get back into yeah. okay so before we take a break again um where can people find you so best place to find me Instagram. I'm Dr. Lara Zib. I'm the same on uh, YouTube as well. And my website is drlarazib.com. All right. All right. We'll be back everyone with more food freedom. Welcome back everyone to transformation with Martine. That's me. And this is where we overcome everything and compromise nothing. My guest today is Dr. Laura Zabaris. And we are talking about diet culture, food freedom, true food freedom, yeah. and um, getting past, um, well, restricting certain foods or that one food is good, one's bad. Um, Cause like she said, it's just, it's just food. So um, did you ever in your journey use exercise as a way to burn off your bad deed of that chocolate. Absolutely, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. So I definitely went through a, a phase, probably more so in the early years when I was dieting and um, that, those years were, while I was bulimic, I definitely saw exercise as a way to burn calories. And I used to make sure that I was doing enough. I wanted it to be high impact. So in my head, I thought, high impact, it's got to be sweaty, I've got to be doing enough of it. Um, Only that counts, because if you're just, you know, moving or walking, that's not good enough. So (laughs) that was the stage when, you know, aerobics, I used to do aerobics, I used to do workouts from all the supermodels, because they all released all those workout DVDs, didn't they? So I thought if I followed those workouts, I would look like them. But yeah, absolutely. That was very much part of my regime to, um, 
yeah in that kind of disordered eating disordered relationship with exercise for sure Mm -hmm. yeah because I I um I did a program once where it's like well you can eat whatever you want but if like you know within these guidelines you can Mm. eat whatever you want and you know if you know you're going to go out tonight and have some wine and some dessert make sure you have just protein and produce all day yeah so that to me it was um it was very triggering it i think caused me more problems Mm -hmm. than it helped me to get past my my issues um And I know for me, it started out where my dad had said one time, he goes, you know, you're too fat. No man's ever going to want you. Mm -hmm. And that is like what spiraled me down. And I want to say I was about 11 at the time. And that just like, oh, God, just put this fear in me. And then like you Mm -hmm. were talking about how everyone around you was doing it. Yeah. You know, they would like I would go for uh, like almost a whole week without food and then on the weekends I'd wow. find yeah yeah find everything I could find to put in mm-hmm. and then I would try to find foods that were easy to get rid of which was mm-hmm. another thing and I know so many people um not only that they they share their journeys on social media or whatever or some that just are so ashamed of what's going on that they won't share at all. And that Mm -hmm. might be been even the beginning of these other people's journeys that are sharing. Um, You got in your twenties, you started making a change. Was there a point where you just thought, Oh my God, like you felt shame or you felt like, Oh geez, I know this isn't right, but what am I going to do? Yeah. I mean, the shame element is huge, Mm -hmm. isn't it? Because I, yeah. I remember very, very clearly, I um, had just finished my degree in psychology, actually. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when I started getting the inkling that I knew that what I was doing was wrong, but I didn't really know what to do about it. And then I just moved to London, where I now live. And so I was kind of finding my feet as new to London. I had a new job. I was living in a new place. And I know for me that then my bulimia became a bit of a coping mechanism because it was a way that I could control things. And talking about that shame element, I used to share a a flat with a friend. And so I was hiding my eating disorder from everyone. No one knew what was going on. And if anyone had said, you know, how's Lara? They would never have said, oh, she's suffering from bulimia. No one knew about it. So I would know when my friend, my flatmate was going to be out. And on the way back from work, I used to stop in the corner shop. I used to buy a whole load of things, like you say, that were easy to kind of, you know, get rid of. And I'd go home and I would, I would sit and have a very planned binge followed Mm -hmm. by a purge. And I know that there was a lot of shame in that. And then I also started dating someone who is now my husband Mm -hmm. and it was, I think that period of time when I was like, gosh, I'm doing this. I don't want to be doing, I'm hiding it from everyone. Now I'm dating someone. I know that you know, that was the, the period when I was like, right, I really need to seek help and sort this out. I don't want to be doing this anymore. But there was that period of time before he found out, but I think he suspected as well. And I remember him saying, we went out for dinner and he nipped off to the toilet and after he came back and he was like that was quite a long time and I think he knew he knew but he didn't say anything and I was like oh my gosh he knows and it was quite soon after that that I ended up you know telling him what was going on and he was so amazing and supportive Um, but still during that journey I still didn't tell anyone else I think he was the only person that knew maybe my best friend as well and that was it they were the only people that knew and it was only years later after I was fully recovered that I started telling people about it because for me there was so much shame involved like you're so right because it it feels like a dirty secret yeah it's kind of no other way of describing it. it feels so wrong and it feels like a dirty secret And it was only after I was fully recovered that I was then able to say to other friends, oh, you know, I had bulimia in my early 20s. They were like, no, did you? And I was like, yeah, like 
it was not good. But it's only been even more recently that I've been fully transparent about it. And every, you know, everyone knows, but it's taken a while because there, you're right, there is that. And it, I don't know, I think maybe um, the help around eating disorders is a bit better now, but certainly when I was going through it, I feel like it was, yeah, even when I went to see my um, physician to, to get a referral, there was a lot of, you know, I don't know, I just, it felt, it felt, felt shameful. Yeah, it's a good it way to describe it. And it's like, so many things were said to me, like, especially for my parents when they did find out um, and they, I think they knew, just like you said, your husband mm. did and all that, or other people might've known. Um, it's just like, well, you're wasting food. Mm. You're, I mean, and, and um, like, God, it's a stupid thing to do. And it just, it just felt like, well, yeah, I guess it kind of is, but it's my reality. It's what I'm yes. doing. It's my way of yeah. controlling. Yeah. And coping. I felt, I felt that double thing. It was like, it was a way of controlling and coping at the same time. Like, you yeah. know, I was obviously experiencing stress and obviously mm -hmm. you have in your past, like mm -hmm. it feels like a, a coping mechanism at the time that feels like normal, but it's only in hindsight when you're like, yeah, that that's disordered. It's, right. it's yeah. Well, one of the things that um, I teach and my coach actually, she taught me to begin with, it's like um, things around you, like, say, you know, I'm a very organized, neat person. I like my house nice and neat and clean and all that. And I also know that I am much more um, fastidious about it if things are not right inside. Mm. It's like trying to control somewhere. Mm. Yeah. What's going on in here, I'm trying to control it out here, which is what yeah. I believe we did yeah. with an eating disorder is the only control I had. Yeah, totally. I 100% I agree with that. And then it becomes, mm -hmm. it becomes your crutch, doesn't it? Yeah. So where do you start with someone who comes to you? And I guess, depending upon where they are is where you start. Yes. Where would somebody yeah. like me, for example, who is pretty in, where do you start with someone? The very first step for me is about helping people ditch diet culture. Mm -hmm. to see that diet culture has impacted them even though often when you're in it you don't realize the extent to which it's impacted you so a lot of that early work is about understanding how diet culture has impacted you and then I do a lot of um, I guess from my psychology background a lot of ex exploration around where your core beliefs have come so your core mm -hmm. beliefs around yourself in terms of worthiness your capability around weight your um, health and your body and that early understanding helps people realize why they are like they are and why they've dieted why they've trying to try to change their, themselves once we've done that work then definitely the next step is around removing restrictions and learning to neutralize food so taking the labels away mm -hmm. trying to allow people to have more food in their life taking it off the pedestal and honestly, that helps with that sort of binge approach, because if people know the food's there, they're not going to get rid of it. They're not going to chuck it in the bin. It's always going to be there. You know, you don't need to eat the whole packet of biscuits because you're going to have some more biscuits tomorrow. So you can eat two or three or four or five even. And I know for a lot of people, that is a really scary process. And it was with me. But once you start facing those fear foods and allowing it into your life, it becomes less of a big deal. So I always get people to do that, this thought experiment and say, you know, what's your favorite food that you would never allow in your house? And a lot of people say something like ice cream or chocolate. And I say, well, imagine, let's take ice cream as an example. Imagine I say, you are gonna have ice cream for breakfast, lunch and dinner tomorrow. And then you have breakfast, lunch and dinner the next day. You know that there will be a time, a point where actually you're really bored of yeah. it's like not, not for breakfast again I can't eat ice cream again yeah and that's the point where because it's there you're like actually you know what I just want I don't know like porridge for breakfast I don't yeah. want yeah. any ice cream I want a salad for lunch I don't want ice cream and it's it's helping people face the food that takes the um that attachment to the food away because it's there and you don't need to bend on it now. Yeah, that that's so perfect. 
you know, because that is true. I remember working um, in a yogurt shop for a while and it got to the point where, yeah, I could have as much as I wanted. Like, well, I'm kind of done. Yeah, you know? exactly. When it's there, you're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. all right. Yeah, that's a very good point. So again, where can people find you before we take our break? So I am on Instagram at Dr. Lara Zib, also on YouTube at Dr. Lara Zib, and my website is drlarazib.com. Easy to remember. Exactly. <laughs> All right. We'll be back, everyone, to finish our show. And oh, and if anybody happens to um, want to call in with a question, is that okay, Dr. Lara? Yes, of course. Okay. Of course. 800 930 2819, in case anybody has a question. Feel free. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Transformation with Martinet. This is where we overcome everything and compromise nothing. Um, today, my guest is Dr. Laura Zavaris, and we've been talking about diet culture and actual food freedom. A lot of diets out there, a lot of other people talk about food freedom, but when food freedom means actually you are free, not that you have to eat a certain way. So we talked a little bit on the break um, about fear, like when fear comes up where you and I have both experienced, you know, being in a restaurant and just being pretty much near tears because you might be in a restaurant where the calories are on there and they are big. <laughs> P.F. Chang's, that happened to me quite a while back and just sitting there like, oh my God, what do you teach your clients about that? Or how did you um, start to deal with those anxious feelings? Yeah. So it's a really good question because it comes up for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we said just before the break about removing restrictions. Mm -hmm. I think the other element to that is about helping to neutralize food so one of the things we learn in diet culture and, you know, I, I still sometimes, you know, hear my family talk about it, for example, but we hear this idea that some foods are better than others. Mm -hmm. So you think that, you, you know, much better off if you're in a restaurant, for example, having the salad over the burger, for, for example. Yeah, right, right. And that's because diet culture has told us that some foods are better than others. It puts this kind of yeah. moral element. We hear people talk about healthy, unhealthy, good, bad. You hear a lot of diet culture marketing where we call it, we talk about mm. guilty pleasures and this is guilt free. And so there's a lot of moral labels that come on it. Mm. So I think we've been programmed and certainly this is where I was to think that we need to eat in a certain way. And then alongside that, what we're learning from diet culture is that in order to be healthy, we need to be a certain size. And for most people that is thinner than we are currently. Now, one of the things I do a lot of with my clients is helping to separate the idea that in order to be help healthy, you need to be thin mm -hmm. because that's the message we receive from diet culture, but it's not the actual truth. And there's a lot of amazing research coming out that's showing that Actually, you cannot tell just by looking at someone how healthy they are. Mm. So health doesn't have a certain size or yeah. a certain look or a certain weight. And even the way that things like the body mass index, the BMI is used is very flawed. So we think that if we go to the doctor and they say that we're in the quote unquote overweight category that then that is a bad thing but in actual fact there's this amazing research study um, by uh, um, well it's a group of a group of researchers but Baskaran Baskaran and colleagues in 2018 did this amazing study where they looked at a population of over 3.6 million people mm -hmm. and what they did was they looked at the different BMA might BMI categories mm -hmm. and what the long-term health outcomes were for these people. So it was a, it was a lo longitudinal study. They did it over time. It was a cohort study. And what is amazing, what they found 
is that actually the people who were in the overweight category, quote unquote, overweight category, had the best health outcomes. So they were the healthiest, they lived the longest, they were less likely to have um, issues, heart issues, et cetera. And the people that had the worst health outcomes were the people who were underweight, considered underweight by the BMI category. And actually there were, you know, in all ways of measuring it, the long-term health outcomes, even like more likely to die. Yeah. Um, and what was very, very interesting about this is that the, their health outcomes for the people very, very underweight were worse than people in the overweight or what is classified as quote unquote, uh, sorry, quote unquote, like obese and quote unquote, morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. So this kind of turns the thinking on its head and says, actually, we can't know by looking at someone how healthy they are. And then there's further research that talks about um, what they call the fat but fit paradox. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, you're much more likely to um, be healthy if you focus on health promoting behaviors, those are, and often that includes movement, not necessarily high impact exercise, but just movement. Right, right. And this fat but fit par paradox shows that people who are, and I use fat in terms of a um, descriptive word, so this is what they, they use to describe um, the people, that fat people who are fit have better health outcomes than thin people who are unfit. And this is by um, a group of researchers at Ortega is the main researcher. Mm -hmm. And so they actually conclude that people are much better focusing on their cardiovascular fitness than actually losing weight. It's a much better way to predict health. So, and there's loads and loads of other research. I could literally be here all night talking about it. But I think once people really understand that how they look and their weight does not impact their health, then they can actually focus on what does impact their health. Because if people really, you know, diet culture would have you thinking that you need to lose weight in order to be healthy. But if that's not actually true, then what do you need to do in order to be healthy? And there are things that we can do to improve our health. And they are things that most people can do. So we need to move more. And like I say, it's it's not that necessarily high in tech aerobics exercise that I was doing back in my past. It's just moving. So it can be going for a walk. It can be um, gardening. It can be doing the cleaning. It can do, be doing the vacuuming. It's just like moving your body. Um, eat fruit, fruit and veg. You know, we know that. That's what everyone talks about in the UK. They recommend five pieces of fruit and veg a day. That's something that can improve our health. Getting enough sleep. So this is like one of the most overlooked things, like actually getting between seven and eight hours of sleep a night can positively impact our health and all sorts of things that don't include losing weight. So a lot of what I work on with my clients is helping them separate the idea that in order to be healthy, because that's why most people go on diet or try to lose weight is because they think it's going to make them healthy. But if we can separate that idea that weight loss equals health and actually other things equal health, then we can take some of that fear away because, um, you know, it, that's not, it's not going to make you unhealthy if you maybe do you do put on a bit of weight. It's, right. you know, it's not the end as well, but, and then taking away that fear of certain foods, I think is a really big thing as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I teach my client, which you probably do too, it's like, if you, if, if you really start taking care of yourself, as in loving yourself for who yes. you are, appreciating your body for taking care of you through your whole life. And yeah. <laughs> collected enough evidence now mm -hmm. i can have thai food i can eat sweets i'm a sweet addict i, I admit it um i like to move i like high yeah. intense i like the hit workouts i like all that i enjoy it yeah. i actually can get away with quite a bit and and i enjoy all of it now so it's a it's a, it's a difference when we can find what like what rhythm works for us and we can just look mm -hmm. at ourselves like you know what girl you're doing pretty freaking good yeah I think that changes. It. Yeah, it does. And I, I love the point you said about coming at it from a point of self-love. Because yeah. if you if you are coming at it from a, a point of I want to look after my body, 
mm-hmm. is so different to when you're saying, I hate my body, I need to change. That's it's and, and instead you're saying, actually, I appreciate my body for all it's done for me, and I want to look after it. And looking after it may mean eating some more fruit and veg or moving every day, but I'm doing it from a point of view of gratitude and love rather than, you know, hate. <laughs> Yes, it's all the difference in the world. That's what's changed yeah. me finally and yeah. able to let things go, you know, and live a little bit more normal. So this has been an awesome show. Um, yeah. I am so grateful for you being on here, sharing your wisdom. Thank you. And one Thank more you. time, where can people find you? Yeah, so best place to find me is on Instagram. I am at Dr. Lara Zib or YouTube also at Dr. Lara Zib and my website, which is drlarazib.com. And I would encourage all of you go to her Instagram because she's very funny <laughs> and she's very informative <laughs> and she's just plain fun to watch. She's got oh, down. Thank the you. That she's got. <laughs> so thank again, you. thank you so much. It was an honor to have you on the show and everyone we will see you next time. Please join us next every Friday, 1 PM Pacific, 1 PM Eastern, 10 AM Pacific. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to Transformation with Martinet. Did listening today spark a sense of hope and possibility? Hold on to this feeling and tune in every second and fourth Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific for more inspiring conversations with Martinet and her guests. They will show you there is hope and you are right where you need to be. Martinet is dedicated to supporting you right where you are while launching you towards promise, passion, and possibility that leads to the fulfilled life your heart aches for. If you're tired of being stuck, schedule a complimentary consultation with Martinet and get on the exciting path towards the life you want to be living. Visit martinetemmons.com and make your appointment today.